Hello, welcome to the side topic um, on the family of Abraham. So, to give you some idea, Abraham is one of three sons of a guy called Terah. Uh, his brothers are Nahor and Haran. Haran has a daughter called Milcah, and Nahor marries Milcah, his niece. And they have a son called Bethuel. And Bethuel will come in later. But meantime, Abraham marries Sarah. Now, in Genesis uh, 20, we discover that Sarah is Abraham's half-sister. They have the same father, um, but different mothers. Now, this is probably literal. We think, maybe. I'm not a biblical scholar. Um, it could be that they are from the same lineage, but the way it's written up makes it sound like actually Terah had Sarah with another woman and Abraham married her. Um, their child Isaac, who is the second born... Do you know what? I'm just going to stick a diagram up. Patriarch and his descendants in purple, right? Wives in orange, everybody else in green. Here you go. So, you can now see that Isaac is Abraham's son, Jacob is Isaac's son, and Jacob is the father of the twelve tribes. But, if you look at the other descendants of Terah, you will notice that Abraham marries Terah's daughter, Isaac marries Terah's great-granddaughter Rebecca, who is Abraham's great-niece, and Jacob marries Rebecca's nieces, Rachel and Leah. So, his mum has got nieces that he marries. He marries his cousins. Okay. Why is this important? Well, it's not particularly important. And you'll notice on there, I've also mentioned Laban may also be the father of the handmaidens that Leah and Rachel have. Um, why am I telling you this? Well, because you've got to understand the wider family to understand how the promise to Abraham is kept. So God promises Abraham that he will be the father of many and that through him people will be blessed. Great. And we know how that works with Jesus Christ. He is the son, eventually, down the line of a tribe of uh, Israel, uh, Jacob's sons, um, therefore from the line of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But they aren't the only people who go on to establish tribes in their own names. So, I want to just show you four other ways that Abraham can be considered part of the history of local tribes and i've marked those up in red there you go so ishmael is abraham's illegitimate oldest son he does not in, he does not inherit the birthright that's isaac's job um, and he is banished along with his mum hagar and god hears hagar's cries and promises to look after them and then after sarah dies abraham has more sons with Keturah. Keturah uh, may be a wife, may be a concubine, not sure where we draw the line there. Certainly no easy way that we can parallel her in today's society that I can kind of immediately think of. But he has sons with Keturah who go on to be strong and blessed and found their own peoples. And Esau... Um, when Jacob and Esau start fighting, it's literally the fight between brothers that will set nations against each other. So the 12 tribes of Jacob, um, 11 full tribes and two half tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, um, they go on to be Israel and then eventually two kingdoms and split up and whatever. Esau's family also becomes local nations. And then... <clears throat> there's Lot. Yeah, about Lot. Read Genesis 19. Let's move swiftly on. Okay, here's a list of all the different people that we've gone, we've come to who are Abraham's descendants. Okay, for reference only. This is not an exclusive list. This is just what I can pick out of Genesis. Big chapters are 25 and 36 for the kind of lineages and the who begat who and, and whatever. But through Jacob, he's got the Israelites. Through Ishmael, he's got the Ishmaelites, 12 tribes of those, all named, you'll notice. Um, through Keturah uh, and her sons, or his sons with her, you've got the Midianites, the Asherites, the Letishites, the Leobites. Through Esau, his grandson, you've got the Edomites, the Amicalites, and the Kenizzites. And then not 
direct descendants of Abraham, but through his nephew, Lot, you've got Moabites and Ammonites. Now, really important to note here, some of these names, if you go and look them up, are going to appear very, very commonly in the history of the Jewish nation, of, of the people of Israel, because they come into conflict and or are conquered by and or have to share space with. Um, you don't get the complete list of baddies. There are still people out there who are going to be against God and his people who are not descendants of Abraham. But actually, when you look at it, it's a pretty comprehensive list. I just want to take a moment and look at it from Jacob's point of view, or even better, Joseph, actually. Let's go with Joseph. Joseph would have two parents, right? Jacob and Rachel. He'd have four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, and so on and so forth. But because of the way his family is set up, actually, some of the people appear more than once in his family tree. Let me show you. Joseph's dad is Jacob. Jacob's dad is Isaac. Isaac's dad is Abraham. Abraham's dad is Terah. Abraham is married to Sarah, whose dad is also Terah. Okay. So far, slightly odd. Terah is Joseph's great-great-granddad twice. But also, Nahor is Joseph's great-great-granddad twice. He's the father of Bethuel, who is the father of Rebekah, who married Isaac, and he's the father of Bethuel, who is the father of Laban, whose daughter Rachel married Jacob. So Joseph's got Nahor as a great-great-granddad twice, which means his dad, Terah, hold on, Terah sounds familiar, is his great-great-great-granddad twice. But hold on, Nahor married Milcah, whose granddad is Terah. So Joseph's got Terah as a great-great-granddad, a great-great-great-granddad, and a great-great-great-great-granddad twice over each time. That's tight-knit. I mean, I, you get people who are proud of being an eighth Welsh, but I mean, I'd hate to do the percentages on this. This is a lot of one line appearing in one man's family past. Um, and the idea that God had all this ordained. I'm really not going to address any of the questions we might have over some of these relationships that look like they might be invalid under the law given to Moses, because that was a lot later, and we don't know exactly if this is meant to be taken literally or it's a, a way of validating the different people who join the family. But what's really clear is that God has chosen this one family, this one line of descendants, to be his chosen people. And if we go back and look at the list of all the tribes that Abraham is even slightly directly father of, God has picked this lot, these ones. And when his son is born, he's one of them. And he completes the law and he fulfills the promise. And the promise isn't just for Abraham's family. It's for everyone. Which means there is space for you on God's family tree. Go and read Genesis. It's an absolute riot. I can't even pretend that I understand maybe more than the half of it most of the time. But it is the story of God setting in motion events that are going to lead to the permanent, once-for-all salvation of the entirety of his people, all of us, his children. Um, have a great Advent. Um, Merry Christmas. Cheers.